Hello fourth grade, this is Mrs. Kilmeyer. Today we're going to continue our read aloud. Afterwards you will have a postcard activity where it asks you to talk about a specific location and event that happened at that location. So today as I'm reading across the wide and lonesome prairie, pay attention to the different locations that we're going to be talking about and different events that are occurring along the way. Keep in mind that as I am reading, I'm going to be skipping around a little bit. So there are going to be some spots where we're going to move forward. That way we can get to lots of different locations. So with that, we're going to continue our reading of Across the Wide and Lonesome Prairie. April 22nd, Thursday, Alcove Spring. We are three days west of Independence, camped at Alcove Spring. Water gushes from a ledge down 10 feet into a pool where there are ferns in deep shade. How delicious the water tastes. Ma and I waited our turn with other women in the wagon train to fill our canteens and jugs. A tiny frog swam into my palm, then out again. All the while, we were serenaded by crickets. My feet are sore and blistered, so much that it hurts to walk. It felt good to soak them into in the cool pond. I want to go barefoot, but Mama says there are too many stickers and thorns. Soon enough, the blisters would turn to calluses, she said. When we finally pulled out of Independence, leaving behind the Missouri River, the sun wasn't up yet. Two dozen wagons were already ahead of us. Behind were hundreds of cows, horses, and sheep. I was so excited, I yelled, hooray, hooray! At long last, we were on our way to Oregon. But oh, the dust. So much dust, we could barely see the rumps of our own oxen. My eyes stung, and we all were coughing. Pa steered to one side of the trail, but other families pulled alongside, making for our breast. I soon tired of the bumping and jolting and rattling and sitting in a cramped space, so I gathered my skirt about my knees and jumped to the ground. I ran between the wagons until I saw Pepper sitting up with her paw. I hollered to her. When she looked down, her skirt flew up, showing off her leggings white as cattails. We hurried away from the trail where it wasn't as noisy. We walked for six hours and talked the whole time. She said, Hattie, when we get to Oregon, let's ask our fathers to build houses right next door to each other. And I said, then we can share a garden. I'll plant the lettuce and corn. You plant tomatoes. So as we walked along, Pepper and I planned out our whole feature, down to the matching lace curtains we'd make for our bedrooms, the pet kittens we'd raise, and so on. My, how the dust leaves a gritty taste in our mouths. It is awful. With every step, our hems pick up burrs from the tall grasses. Dried brush scratches our ankles. Finally, that first day when the sun was directly overhead, everyone stopped. Pepper and I were so wore out, we fell back into the shade of our wagon laughing. Do we have to keep going? We asked Paul. He just smiled at us as he carried water to the animals. The first night camping was a late one with singing and dancing. Pepper and I swung in a circle with Jake and the other little twins round and round. We are on our way, was the cry heard over and over. Even Ma joined in when folks started singing Buffalo Gals. But when Pa asked her to do -si do she lifted Benny onto her hip and turned for the wagon. Time for bed, she said. Maybe when Ma sees Oregon, she will dance. Okay, we're going to skip a little bit ahead. April 27th, Tuesday. A few days ago, we crossed the Kansas River. At first, I was scared watching the horses wade in because water splashed their heads and I worried they wouldn't be able to breathe. But somehow, they managed to swim, paddling like dogs, their necks stretched high and strong. Now we are at the Big Blue River, which is much wider and faster than the Kansas. The men are discussing how we should cross it and whether we should do so now before dark. Everyone is dead tired. Most families want to spend the night on this side because there's plenty of dry firewood and they want to rest. One lady yelled out, we are wore out, mister. Can't you see that? But tall Joe just stood high on a wagon seat and held up his arms for quiet. Got across now, he shouted back. He said the river is low, but it could rise overnight. No telling. Another thing he said, come tomorrow morning, the animals will be so frisky, they'll be harder to force into the water. I must help Ma wrap up the cheese and figs we ate at noon and change Benny's wet pants. Already two men are riding to the other side. Water is up to their saddles, and the horses' tails are floating. Several boys on horseback are whooping and yelling as they ride across. Their rifles were taken away from them so they wouldn't shoot anybody by mistake. Hooray. April 2, question mark, Wednesday, I think? While crossing the Big Blue, Jake, Benny, and I sat in our little spot in the wagon. As we floated, I could feel the pull and jerk as the animals struggled to swim. We could see forward through a small space between boxes. 
There were many wagons ahead of us, their white tops swaying from the current. Suddenly, Pa jumped into the river to turn our oxen because they were trying to swim downstream. Ma grabbed the reins and wrapped them around her hands. When we began tipping over on our right side, I screamed, terrified we'd sink. Water poured in through the canvas. I could see that Ma's bonnet had fallen back over her shoulders, and she was pulling the reins hard, trying to turn the animals. Everything in the wagon not tied down slid toward us. Two sacks of beans rolled onto my legs, and a bag of flour burst open when it fell against the rocker. While looking straight ahead, Ma yelled for us to lean with all our weight against the high wall. As we clung to an overhead hoop, one of the lanterns swung and hit my head so hard I wanted to let go, but I knew I must keep my arm around little Ben so he wouldn't get washed away. Pa kept swinging with the oxen, and with Ma's help, we somehow tipped back up. Seeing forever, but it was probably just a minute. Benny was crying because he was scared and his clothes were wet. The three of us were covered with a gooey white paste from the spilled flour. It felt awful. My sleeves were sticky and my braid was stick- stiff as a broom. Finally, there was a thump as our wheels touched bottom, then there was splashing as our team pulled us through the mud and onto the beach. More water rushed in, soaking our blankets, but we've hung them over brush to dry while we wait on shore for the others. It might take two days to get everyone across. I don't, I hope we don't have to cross any more rivers. This afternoon, my little friends, the twins, wandered off to pick berries, but now it's near sunset and they're not returned. Their parents are frantic and I'm worried sick. Tall Joe and Pa are leading a search party. I wanted to help too, but Ma said she needs me to watch Jake and Benny so she can go sit with the twins' mother to comfort her. Oh, those poor children, they're much too small to be lost. Okay, we have to skip ahead to another day. There was someone else that stayed behind to continue searching for the um, twins while the rest of them moved on. Another day. Today we came to the Little Blue, but thank God we didn't have to cross it. Our wagons are so heavy, the oxen strain to pull us up the trail. We'll follow the river into Nebraska. Every time we stop and the dust is settled, I look back to see if the little twins and their family have caught up. No one speaks of them, and I don't know why. This morning, I made batter for pancakes. I went to the stream to fill my pitcher, but when I returned to camp, the batter was black with mosquitoes. I started to dump it into the dirt, but Aunt June put her hand on my arm. Hattie, she said, don't waste, just stir them up good. The griddle's hot enough to cook them through and no one ever died from such. So, we had mosquitoes for breakfast. Jake called them mosquito cakes, and he said they tasted just fine soaked in molasses. But to me, they were like sand in my teeth. When we opened one of our sacks, we found the bacon to be green and crawling with maggots. Fifty pounds of it. Mom was so furious, she shouted at my father. That butcher in Independence said it would last months, and look here, she said to Pa, whipping her finger along the meat. There ain't a lick of salt anywhere. Every day, it seemed that there is a new disappointment for my poor mother. Jake thought it was all right by him if we cooked up some maggots, but Pa dragged the sack outside of camp and buried it. At least three other families were sold rotten meat also. Okay, we're going to skip along to May 10th. May 10th, Monday. As we headed down a bluff towards the Plate River, there was another already many campfires, tents, and wagons. It felt the same as when our steamboat arrived in Independence. So many people. Most are from Wisconsin Territory. They have northern accents, a speech that is not near as slow as folks from Kentucky. Some brothers from Iowa have brought up with them 800 young fruit trees to plant in Oregon. The seedlings are just a few inches tall. Well, said Pa, seems these here are our new traveling companions. The trail is broad and sandy here on the south side of the Platte, and it feels like we're pulling uphill. Pa says we'll go over 100 miles before we have to cross, and it will take maybe 10 days. I do dread having to cross another river. Mosquitoes are fierce. There are itchy bites on my arms, neck, and cheek, even on my head where my hair is parted. It is near impossible not to scratch vigorously. Every morning we fry up our skeeter cakes. I've tried and tried to stir quick, and even if the batter is clean when I pour, somehow bugs see it as a place to land, and land they do, like specks of pepper. I can see no way around it. At night, there are campfires way across the river on the north side. Our men are talking low among themselves, wondering if Indians are following us. If they are following us, what are we to do? Come sun up, all we can see is dust and horses and what looks like wagons. 
But so, Pa says, if they ain't Indians, what are they? And why do they travel alone? Okay, skipping ahead a bit. We are going to start where it says, I don't know what day this is. We crossed the South Platte. So this is after about 10 days of travel. I've not felt like riding until now. This river is near a mile wide and so shallow, lots of folks walk across. This was a very great relief to me. Pepper and I challenged Gideon and some other boys to a race, but we were soon slowed down by our wet skirts. When Gideon saw us struggling to run in the waist high water, he stepped between us, took our hands, and helped us pull us across. It was the first time any of us had laughed for two days. Once ashore, we flopped down in the warm sand and stared up at the sky. It was such a lovely blue. I felt for that moment happy again. Then we're going down to later. Now that we're in the North Platte River Valley, the air feels dry and thin. My lips are so chapped, they bleed when I talk. The only thing to do is dip our fingers into the bucket of axle grease and rub our lips every hour or so. It smells bad, it tastes bad, and the blowing dust sticks. It feels like we must be halfway to Oregon, but Tall Joe says no, we've only gone 500 miles. He also said the worst part of the trail is to come. Does he mean more rivers to cross? Will it be Indians? I'm afraid to ask what he's talking about. The Anderson's wagon had an accident when we climbed up Windlass Hill, and we were heading down the other side. It was so steep that at the top of the hill, we unhitched the teams and led them down separately. Then we chained the wheels to keep them from turning. Also, we cut small trees and tied them behind each wagon for drag to slow it down as men lowered them with ropes and pulleys. That's why this place is called Windlass Hill took hours and hours. I was nervous watching the men strain so hard, their heels dug into sand, their palms bleeding from the ropes. Ma and some other ladies tore their petticoats into rags to wrap around the men's hands. What happened with the Anderson wagon is that their front axle hit a stump, which caused the smaller rope to snap. Before anyone could help, the wagon flipped over and over and over, landing in splinters at the bottom. Folks screamed, but it was just the shock of seeing such an accident. No one was hurt. Thank God Mrs. Anderson and her daughters were watching from the top of the hill, for they had climbed out earlier to lighten the load. The only belongings they could rescue were clothes and blankets that were strewn over the rocks when their trunks split open, and a few tools. Aunt June and Uncle Tim right away invited the family to share their own wagon and supplies for the rest of the journey. We also will share. Hazel, Holly, Laurel, and Olive will take turns riding with us. I don't mind giving up my very um, small spot inside as it's hot from the sun beating down on the canvas top. I'm tired of the bumping and rattling. Besides, something always tipping over. Yesterday was Ma's burrow. Things are packed in so tight that the bouncing makes the ropes fray. My opinion is it ain't safe in there. Okay, I'm going to skip ahead to Ash Hollow. The plot split into two, so now our trail is along the North Platte River. Our reward for making it down Windlass Hill is the most beautiful campsite yet. It's called Ash Hollow because of so many thick, shady ash trees. There's a spring with fresh, icy water, so we can fill up our barrels and such. Everywhere we look, there's firewood and good pasture for the animals. It is so peaceful, Ma said, oh, Charles, can't we stay here forever? A few years ago, some immigrants did exactly that. A family built themselves a cabin and plowed a field. They are friendly to us and have offered to post our letters with the next travelers headed down, but heading back to Missouri. Many of us quick wrote to friends. I tore out a sheet of paper from this journal and sent Becky a drawing of hemlock, telling her all. The moon is full, so I'm writing by its light as I sit near the wagon. There are hundreds of campfires tonight and singing. Ma is walking along the creek with Mrs. Anderson, who has been silent for days. Ma says she's grieving that she finally realizes little Cassia is gone and that her grave is far away in a lonely place along a river she'll never see again. I'm so very sad for her. This makes me watch Benny and Jake more closely, for I don't know how Ma and Pa and me could go on if they became lost or died somehow. There are Indians, about 20, camped nearby. The sight of them makes me so nervous I feel vomity. Some women come near, holding their hands out, talking in their language. Their deer skin dresses have tiny beads sewn along their sleeves. Their hair is braided over their shoulders. One of them wore a basket on her back with a baby inside, a dark-haired baby with dark, quiet eyes. They accepted Ma's corn cakes without a smile. 
I asked Tall Joe why they were begging. They ain't begging, he said. Indians are hospitable people, and if they were as passing through our land, they'd give us a gift. They're just asking for ours. They look like beggars to me, but they are not making trouble. Matter of fact, one of the women did something real nice. She saw Miss Anderson off by herself crying and walked over to her with a square of deerskin the size of a plate. On it was several chunks of cooked meat. She picked up a piece and put it to Mrs. Anderson's lips, nodding for her to eat. The woman then pointed to the little Anderson girls playing in the stream, then motioned with their hands and mouth like she was eating. Finally, Mrs. Anderson accepted the gift. I think she understood that the Indian woman wanted her to take nourishment for the sake of her little daughters. Okay, we're going to skip through to the next day. In the far distance, the prairie and low hills are black. I thought there must have been a fire, but tall Joe said, nope, it's just buffalo, thousands and thousands of them. After supper, I sat by the fire to mend Benny's blanket. He lay next to me in the dirt, talking about this and that. Then suddenly, I was fast asleep. I like the way he folds into my arms when I carry him to bed. Okay, and we're going to move on to the last week in May. So skipping quite a bit of other things. So last week in May, thereabouts. In the far distance, we can see something poking up from the horizon like a thumb pointing at the clouds. Tall Joe says this is Chimney Rock. It is the closest thing to a mountain that I have ever seen. The woman who had a baby back in Ash Hollow died of fever this morning. She was buried in a bluff overlooking the valley. Her newborn daughter is being cared for by another mother, and friends are helping the father with his three little boys. Chimney Rock. For two long days, we approached Chimney Rock. It seemed to take forever. Two evenings, we watched the sunset behind it as we ate supper. Now that we're here, it's a curious sight. A huge pile of rocks with what looks like a stone chimney rising up from its center. Jake and several boys hiked around its base and counted 10,000 steps. I don't know how they kept track of so many numbers, but they did. Tall Joe said some other folks counted years past and they also said 10,000. Boys with rifles are shooting at the top of Chimney Rock to see what will happen. They like the fuss and noise. Now some families have souvenir chips tucked in their wagons. And planes are dry with no trees. We're slowly moving towards the Pacific Ocean, but it's near impossible for me to picture a sea other than the sea of grass. All around is open space with colors of gold, green, and brown. Feel we are specks, like bugs, crawling across a kitchen floor. It is very pretty, but I miss the sight and smell of trees, and I do miss my Missouri River. To think I might never again hear the long high whistle of a seaboat makes me feel lonesome. Okay, and then there's Scott Bluff, but we're going to skip ahead to Fort Laramie. Fort Laramie, when Fort Laramie drew into sight, I felt shaky. Indians were camped everywhere, but I looked at them careful and did not see any trouble brewing. They were mostly families, seemed like. Tall Joe said we're now in the middle of Six Country, and this is the biggest trading post around. It's built around from logs and is owned by the American Fur Company. There are dozens of trappers and mountain men dressed in beaded leather and skins and living in teepees. Many seem to be married to Indian women, for there are half-bred children playing along the tents. We're staying for two nights and one full day so folks can make repairs on wagons and buy supplies. A Frenchman runs this place. Way on the other side of the river, we can see Brigham Young's camp. The trail, such as it is, ends so they must cross to our side. The Frenchman has a flatboat. For $15, he'll ferry their wagons across. $15 is a fortune, but Pa says the river is deeper here, so it's probably worth for it for them to pay. We were already on the trail again before the Mormons had crossed over, which was another wagon train that had been passing them, so I reckon they'll be traveling in our dust. There are signposts every few miles. These are messages written on pieces of board stuck in the sand. Also, there are buffalo skulls with writing on them. Some notes are impossible to read because the sun has bleached out the ink or rain has smeared it. There are warnings of bad water, rattlesnakes, and danger, like this one. Willie Henderson and two others died here, June 1846, Buffalo Stampede. We're going to move further along to Register Cliff. The trail goes through limestone, which is soft when wet. Pepper and I carved our names into a boulder by the side of the road using a sharp stone. Our hands grew tired, so we didn't spell out our full names or homes' tones. During the long, hot hours of the day, many of the men driving wagons doze, their reins in hand. 
It's a wonder none have fallen off the seats. Pa looks worn out. Yesterday, a wasp stung him on his neck, and it has swollen up. Ma keeps dabbing mud on it, but it is still sore and red. We are so tired by nightfall, we roll into our blankets and stretch out on the hard ground, lately not using tents. It means one less thing to unpack and repack every day. The breeze is cool on my face. I wish I could keep my eyes open long enough to study the stars, but suddenly it is morning. The bugle has sounded and campfires smell of fresh coffee. Okay, we're going to skip along to... All right, right before Independence Rock, I'm going to start at where it says later. Later, we are camped at the Sweetwater River. I watched from shore while my brothers played in the shallows with some other children. Current is slow, but I still worry they'll be swept away. Independence Rock. From a distance, this sloped rock looks like a bear sleeping on its side. I'm close. It's huge and easy to climb. Folks have been going up to the top to see the view and carve their names. Some boys raced each other, then fired pistols in the air to celebrate. Jake asked Pa if he could have a few sticks of dynamite to throw off the top, just to see what would happen. Pa thought a moment. When he said yes, Jake let out a happy yell. Pepper and I were at the river when we heard the explosion. We turned in time to see a puff of smoke floating down from the top. Some cattle took off running in fright, but were rounded up quickly by men on horseback. I don't understand why boys like such things, or why Pa thinks dynamite is safer than rifles. Okay, and then our last journal entry we're going to look at is clipping along to the South Pass. South Pass. Tall Joe's is where we come near 900 miles. That means we're almost halfway to Oregon. There are cheers and singing and gunshots. Pa thought crossing the Continental Divide would be treacherous, but the gap here is 12 miles wide and gentle as a cornfield. The slope is so gradual we hardly knew where we were. To the north are the Wind River Mountains covered with snow. There's a carpet of yellow and blue wildflowers spread between boulders and pine trees. So beautiful. It's sunny, but the air is thin and cold because of the elevation, about 8,000 feet. Women and girls are picking bouquets to hang on upside down down in our wagons, so they'll keep their color while drying. This way we'll have flowers during our winter in Oregon. Tall Joe says the nights are so cold at South Pass, we must keep going down the western slope to a campground called Pacific Creek. All right, we're going to stop there. So notice after skipping a lot of those different parts, we were able to read lots of different locations that they were able to stop at along the way. So as you go to write your postcard, just keep those things in mind. Maybe pick one of your favorite locations we talked about and then an event that could have happened there. Think about the different um, obstacles they encountered along the way. They had to cross rivers. They had to stop at different campsites. They encountered Indians. And then not only that, but there's a lot of the dangers going along as they went. That There were some things that we had to kind of skip through. So if you're interested, you could go back and reread some of those entries that we had to kind of miss. A lot of times people ended up sick and they couldn't take care of them. Children ended up going missing because if they ran off too far, they couldn't find them. And so there was lots of different things going on along, along the way. One major part we skipped also was that there was some poison that um, she had actually picked up and accidentally almost ate. And that was where she was talking about the hemlock. So just lots of different things that you can talk about as you're going through your postcard. Also be sure to reference the map that's in your slideshow. And so you can maybe see some of these different locations that we talked about in the journals and where they actually land on the map. South Pass is where we're finishing and that's only about halfway through the journey. This book still goes on for another 150 pages or so. So with that, I'm going to let you go. Go ahead and get started on your postcard activity. I look forward to seeing what you write about and what is the event that you're going to talk about. So I will talk to you then. Bye.